gather here for the first time as tiny house enthusiasts. So let's do a quick little poll in the room. Who's in the room? Know your audience. That's rule number one for presentations. <laughs> so who here is from East Coast? Oh. <laughs> who here is from the West Coast? Great Midwest. <laughs> and the South. Got a few Southerners. Excellent. Who here has been dreaming about tiny houses for five years or more? How about three years or more? How about new recent converts? They just drank the Kool Aid, they're really excited. <laughs> Excellent. That's recent Kool Aid drinkers. Um, who here lives in a tiny house? Well, we got some, some lovers. Residence. Excellent. Who here is building a tiny house? Got a few builders. Who here is a builder? Let's see the builders. How about architect? Got some architects in the house. Excellent. Who's a blogger? Got some bloggers. Excellent. Uh, that's all my questions, other than who knows what zoning codes pertain to their county and get a small. How about who has a tiny house in their yard? Yes, thank you. <laughs> For the boneyard. <laughs> um, so that's great to know. Uh, it's really great to see everyone here. Really excited to be here and be invited to kind of kick this off. Um, we're going to talk about Boneyard Studios. Uh, by the looks of it, everyone here is a huge tiny house enthusiast. Um, probably reads the blogs, has been following the tiny house movement for a little while. We and I are among you. Uh, we've been thinking and dreaming about tiny houses for a long time. And we think. Uh, a lot of the thinking in about tiny houses is about how do you put two by fours together and make a structure. Uh, that's what occupies a lot of our time. Uh, but increasingly, as a movement, we think we're growing to a point where we have to think about bricks and mortar or the trailer or the joists. Um, we need to kind of expand the vision even more into how do we mainstream this? How do we basically make this a movement that you know where lots of people can do this? And increasingly, that comes into discussions of zoning and codes and other things that we need to tweak, right? It's not just us individuals, but it's a collective community pushing for change. Um, so part of that is going to segue into our mission, um, which is, I'm not going to read this verbatim, but I'm going to kind of talk through it quickly. So when Lee and I met, um, was it? Uh, fall of 2011. Fall of 2011. Um, we were thinking tiny houses, and then we were thinking, oh, we need to do this together as a community, and how does that work? And we thought, well, what's kind of, what are we really doing? Um, as a tiny house showcase. And so really, the first thing was, well, there's all these vacant alley lots around DC, and well, can we do something cool in them? Can we put tiny houses in them? Uh, a lot of people are building them individually. Can we build them together as a community, a more powerful learning from each other? Uh, and then, of course, everyone knows, everyone's already drank the boys, so they know why tiny houses are cool. Uh, but a lot of people don't, so part of being a showcase is to show that. Um, and to really be able to have people come out, we never, before we committed to building tiny houses, I don't think either one of us had stepped foot in a tiny house. It was kind of a leap of faith, which you shouldn't have to take, right? Buy a car, you can see the car. Mm -hmm. See the car, but um, so a lot of people will come out and, and visit it and see a tiny house for the first time. Um, and then also this whole idea of like, trailer parks are great, and I shouldn't say trailer parks. My grandparents live in the manufactured housing community, and they're awesome. Um, you got a great community, um, everyone's sort of in the same financial boat in some ways. Um, there's all these great activities, uh, they're affordable, etc. A lot of people don't like to look at them. And so tiny houses come along and they're like very attractive, generally. Um, and so we wanted to have a showcase to kind of show what a, this beautiful tiny house community could look like and hopefully inspire others. So hopefully that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then some other stuff, obviously zoning code changes we need to, we need to affect some major changes um, in order to mainstream the movement a bit more. Uh, and then, of course, build up a network of people like all of you, like people who are interested, people who are designing, people who are builders. I hired an architect, he never, I think he dreamt about tiny houses when he was in architecture school, but never had the opportunity to actually design one, and now he is. Now he's like a tiny house architect. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the mission. And with that, maybe we should back up a little bit and kind of talk about ourselves. Yeah, we want to give a quick file. Yes. I hate getting the desk. Give like quick bio, like how do we get into this? I've uh, been thinking about tiny houses since I saw the 
interview with Jay Schaefer several years ago, had moved to DC from the West Coast and really thought like, well, I can't do this until I'm back in Seattle or Eugene or Portland or someplace where I knew people were building tiny houses on wheels. And uh, one day in 2010, I was taking the bus back from New York City and I said, nope, I'm gonna do it in DC, I don't care. I'm just gonna put forward the energy to do so. And that day, I had been Googling tiny houses in DC for over a year and nothing came up. And that day, someone had posted a blog about two single women um, two single mothers, I should say, who are building tiny houses on wheels. So my first introduction to tiny houses on wheels were from two pretty low income women building them uh, for their families who really did not want to be in the public at all. Um, one of my biggest motivations in doing this was really to create community and really to challenge the way that we live in urban spaces, especially highly transient urban spaces like Washington, D.C. So, I took a tumbleweed workshop in 2011, and slowly from that, I met a lot of really cool people, and I started hosting meetup groups at my apartment. 30 to 40 of us would get together, and then slowly we kind of became this little core group of about five to six people when I met Brian, and um, Brian and I decided we wanted to do this, we wanted to do it, try and do it in a community, and started looking for land, and we'll get into that during the presentation, but that's me. Sorry, maybe I should come here. Alright, I don't think that's either. So we have the slides. Okay, whatever. We'll figure it out. Alright, sorry. Um, so I, I can't actually put a finger on the date when I got interested in this. Um, I know when I met Lee, uh, I'd already drank the Kool-Aid and it's like I found another person that's like another co-conspirator. Um, and so we kind of hit it off and started dreaming about this and that definitely helped. So like as soon as you meet other people who are interested in this kind of stuff, right? It's like adding, adding uh, fuel to the fire. Um, but yeah, personal motivations, apart from the, you know, the big picture stuff, is big and kind of policy wonkish. But yeah, personally, why are we doing this? Like, why am I doing this? Uh, part of it was like, I wanted a bigger garden, I wanted some land, um, I wanted more space for a workshop. Uh, and then yeah, I also was interested in building and designing this cool structure. Um, I rehabbed a row house in DC and was kind of looking for another kind of design build challenge. Except I'm not a designer, architect, or builder. But I want to play <laughs> So I hired builder and architect. Um, and I've been trying to learn. So that, yeah, largely those are kind of motivation. I also realized at a certain point that if I could somehow move into a tiny house and live there and rent out the place that I, I bought, um, then I'd be kind of one step much closer to financial freedom, which is obviously I think, well, the main reason we've come across why most people are into this, right? It's like, it's affordable housing. Um, and we don't say that enough, but that's really what it's all about for me as well. Um, so you want to kick off the outline yeah. and we'll jump in? And... Yeah, I always like to give people a little overview. So we're going to go through basically like how this all started, like how we searched for land um, and outreach we did to the community, how we prepped the lot to get the tiny houses on them, some zoning and code issues, show you some pictures of the houses. Both Brian and I are doing the Pachachka tomorrow night talking about our individual builds, so we won't go into too much detail. Um, and then some press we've done and lessons learned with press. And then a bunch of events. We host a lot of fun events on the lot, and the community, and then you know, open it up for discussion and sort of what's next and where can we go with this. So this is uh, Bonier Studios up there next to that lake, which is called McMillan Reservoir. The U.S. Capitol is about two miles south. So when Brian and I met, we knew that we wanted to, a space to build, uh, and ideally land to put it on to put it on. We knew we could probably go find a warehouse and build, but we wanted to actually build on site. So we started looking on Redfin for <coughs> lots in DC, and as Brian will talk about during zoning and code, you can't really build on most alley lots in DC right now. So we ended up finding an alley lot that was a mile from both of our residences. Um, and Brian bought the lot in January or something of 2012, so? Mm, or April. April, okay. Uh, so we bought the lot a little over a year ago. And this is what the lot looked like. It was being used as a parking lot. It's that triangular piece right there. So we abut a graveyard. It's a very actually beautiful graveyard. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, we have quiet neighbors. <laughs> so quickly we started kind of mocking up what it might look like with tiny houses there. We have as you can see, four tiny houses, a shipping container in the right there, some parking, and so we garden beds. Garden beds. So we broke ground, and right after that, that same week, we drew up a flyer 
uh, sort of tell the neighbors who have bought the lot. So there are two rows of row houses that you can see there in the bottom, and then on the left, you don't see all of them, but there's a row of row houses. So we have what, like 12? No, like 18, 17, or 18. 17 or 18 houses that have bought the lot. Um, so we wrote up these flyers about what our plans were, that we were going to be building these tiny houses on wheels, we wanted to have this showcase there, uh, some of the zoning and code that's legal to park travel trailers on this lot. We were going to have a community garden if anyone was interested in gardening space. We also knew parking might be an issue since it had been used as a parking lot for a long time, so we talked about you know getting some temporary parking passes. And then we walked around and we met you know a number of the neighbors. So we knocked on their doors, we went inside, we chatted with them. No one was outright sort of negative about it. No one was really outright positive either. A lot of people obviously had questions. Um, but luckily, that next weekend, Tumbleweed had contacted us at the time to see if they could do an event uh, with a tiny house that was out on the East Coast. So we partnered with a brand new, huge community garden in DC that basically took a big piece of public land and made it into a community garden. And we had a big outreach event at Wangari Garden. So this is about less than half a mile from the Boneyard Studios lot. We had several hundred people come by throughout the day. Uh, we had a you know, presentation about what we were going to be doing with tiny houses in DC. We had the house there to showcase. We had books to, for people to look at. So this was about two weeks after I think broke ground on the lot. Uh, so we did that in addition to going to the Neighborhood Associate Community Association meeting, which those of you who get active in your neighborhood associations probably know that a lot of times it's the folks who have something to gripe about who go to these meetings, not always the folks who are very positive. Um, this Neighborhood Association meeting, of course, has both. And we went and we wanted to be fully transparent, and so we kind of laid everything out which we were going to do, and I think we overwhelmed people. <laughs> and folks got pretty scared, and we got some pretty negative feedback based out of fear, and we had to go and have a strong drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't let that deter us. We had, you know, the Neighborhood Association president had said, I think you need people way too much information too quickly. <laughs> Start with the community gardens, get to know folks. And slowly, that's what we did throughout the summer. And we have some wonderful neighbors that we'll talk more about when Brian talks in the next section. But um, that was sort of the intro to you know, how we got started. It really was just looking on Redfin, finding a piece of land, um, and, and then organizing some events and trying to educate people about tiny houses. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we did on the lot, kind of take you through. This is what it looked like when we got it. Um, no. <laughs> uh, it was it was I mean, basically being used as a parking lot, um, illegally technically, by neighbors because it was owned privately um, for years and years. And it was you know a bunch of gravel, overgrown, weedy, garbage. Literally the the day that the lot was bought, I went out there and I had to call the cops because there was an abandoned stolen vehicle like right there in the middle. <laughs> no one had done anything about it for at least a month because it had been stolen for six weeks. So that got hauled off. Um, and I went out there um, and started like cracking up the concrete um, and did eventually hire some folks to help me with that. <laughs> Especially DC concrete. <laughs> Um, so that's that was my help. Um, there's a whole corner of it was eight inch thick concrete, but the rest of it, like that stuff, was thinner. You can kind of pickaxe that. So I, I was really buff last summer, but not so much. Um, and that was all the concrete removed, and then started grading some of the land as well. It had a kind of a nice natural grade to it, so we could actually park three of the tiny homes uh, on it, and then you can kind of step right out. Rather than stepping down, you step out on the grass, so it's kind of natural. Elevation, and then I also was we excavated um, some soil so you could park a fourth one in and do the same thing off a side door. I'll show you that later. Um, got a shipping container. That was the first thing we did because you know it's DC, it's urban, things go missing. We needed some sort of fortress we could store our tools in, and it turns out there's a port in Baltimore uh, with lots of shipping containers that are empty and for rent. So they deliver this for cheap. You can pay like 150 a month and rent the shipping container. Um, it's, so we have the door added so you can get in out easily, and it's about 20 foot long, so it's got plenty of space, although amazingly we filled up <laughs> quite easily, but um, it's, uh, that was the first one we put on, so you can see it in this picture kind of in the distance. 
And then um, our great friend and builder, Tony, uh, I worked with to put in you know, 48 uh, fence posts and uh, eventually we did, did more fencing um, around the lot. A lot of questions come up with utility, so one of the things we did immediately is contact our utility to get electricity. This is an alley lot, right? No services, zero. Um, so we eventually got power in. Uh, water and sewer hookup, unfortunately we investigated, it was gonna be like 20 grand just to get, and like six or eight months, and the lawyers and everything, just to get the, the pipe coming in from the street to the northwest, we're like, forget that. Um, so what we've been working on for water is basically rainwater collection off the roofs of the tiny house, and then with the little pumps that pump it into the cistern, which sits on top of the shipping container so that when we need the water for the garden, it just kind of gravity feeds down, it works pretty well. Um, and that's, oh, that's, a, that's a cistern. It's not very sexy, but it works. Um, and then a lot of people are asking, well, there's no sewer, so what are you gonna do with the waste? Um, and so, we did a lot of research on this question, and a lot of these problems have been solved, right? Like, somebody somewhere has had this problem before, um, so we just had to find out how they solved it. Um, and so, obviously, composting toilets would be really great, um, except that in an urban environment with lots of press, we're doing the showcase, we didn't really want to have, like, composting toilets, which can be perfectly great and it's clean and sanitary, but we just didn't want anyone, like, getting hung up. Right, on like raw sewage in buckets. Um, <laughs> so we happened upon this great device called the Incinolet toilet. I like to say Incinole. <laughs> it's basically a stainless steel shrine that you sit on, and it's got a big 1500 uh, watt heater element, so it's not terribly sustainable, it's a lot of electricity. But you plug it in, you do your business, you press a little pedal. What kind of business? The <laughs> Sorry. The chamber opens up. Falls into the bowels of Hades, <laughs> the bowels above, and uh, and then it's gone. So uh, like half an hour, it just incinerates. So you have to pipe it and condense it and all that. But it works pretty well. We have talked to different. We have different opinions on this. Yes. Um, but that takes care. No no water in and no dirty water out. So basically, all we have then will be gray water um, when water is used on the lot. What was the cost of that? Those run, they're not cheap. They're like, uh, what, 1800 Yeah, we've got used one. ones offline. You can find used ones. I got mine for half that. Um, so that's kind of the quick and dirty in utilities. We can talk more about that. But basically water, oh, and then natural gas or propane, obviously that's easy. You just run up with your media you stove or hot water. That's what we're using We there. did investigate um, using a fire hydrant down the street. You can get oh, a meter yeah. from the city. And also we have borrowed water from neighbor. So. Yeah, we have a very friendly neighbor who yeah. uses water. Because for the garden, the garden uses so much more water than you're ever going to use on like a residential level. So we have a very friendly neighbor we can tap the tap our hose whenever we need to. So, well, we did some quick calculations, as many of you probably have. Um, you know, quick little rainfall, we can fill up that cistern. Like it's very, not a lot of rain translates into a lot of water discovered. So, um, these are the guys putting the power lines in. Um, and then finally, once we sort of had the lot sort of squared away, shipping container, et cetera, <coughs> fences up, we brought in Jay and I, we bought our trailers. Um, so that's where those are. Um, the, the grade wasn't quite perfect, which is why we had to pick out the grass up to kind of fit it in. <laughs> um, and we also started the garden, so I brought in like 15 yards of compost. Mm -hmm. um, which is really fun to spread in July in DC. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the city subsidized uh, fruit trees. I'm a little bit of a garden fanatic, so we now have like 15 fruit trees planted on the lot and a bunch of flowers, and it's, it's looking pretty. But that was last summer where it was still a little bit barren, but you see the nice fence and the trees. Very happy. Um, What's the size of your lot? Like how big? It's, it's small, so it's like a 11th of an acre. So, which is actually huge for DC. But, you know, out here it's like, that's like very small. Um, and so there's a garden beds going in last summer, and then the garden's starting to grow, and happy turnips, happy lettuce. Um, neighbors are, you know, we give some food away, and we also advertise anyone in the neighborhood that wanted a plot, you know, become gardener. So, didn't have a lot of takers. A lot of people in the neighborhood are not huge gardeners, they don't understand gardening. Um, happy to talk about, I've given away all my, almost all my turnips and stuff, because people get it once they see the vegetables, and hopefully more and more, more people will join. Um, so yeah, there's just flowers. Things are looking better now. It doesn't look like a vacant animal anymore. Uh, fire pit. Dun, dun, dun. 
and then we have a lovely view, as we mentioned, of the quiet neighbors. <laughs> we wish all the neighbors were this quiet. <laughs> but we wish they stayed alive. We just don't know. Kind of <laughs> I know, this poor dead tree just got taken down. Yeah, they, yeah. they were afraid of it falling and crushing gravestones. Anyway, um, now I'm going to talk, and before anyone falls asleep, so me and Coz, but quick, quick, not too fast. Um, there's a lot of people who are thinking about doing this right on the lot, somewhere, somewhere. Um, and so what we did before we bought the lot, I ended up buying the lot, but did a lot of research together. It's been very much a community effort from the very beginning. Um, so we tried to do our homework on what we could or couldn't do on this lot and actually several other lots. So you go down to your local zoning building code place and you do some research and you go online and you do all the kind of due diligence before you pump down money. Um, and I thought I did a pretty good job, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> so basically this alley lot that um, we have is basically, so it's an alley lot, right? There's no contiguous street like abutting the property. It's all alleys, all 10 foot, 15 foot, 20 foot alleys, no streets. Um, and in DC, oh yeah, there we go. Just a picture. Just a picture. Um, in DC, what that means is you can't build any residential structures on the alley lots <coughs> in the current zoning period, um, except if the alley lot is 30 feet wide. Why 30 feet? It's mostly because um, so. Emergency vehicles can get like fire trucks can get down the alley to put out fires. So there's currently like a zoning rewrite that might change. We hope it will. We've been testifying, etc. But right now, basically, all you can do, um, well, what can you do? Can you park trailers or manufactured housing or whatever on the lot? Yes. Can you build a tiny house on the lot? Yes. Can you live in the in the tiny house on the lot? Tiny house on wheels on the lot? No. Mm -hmm. So that's why we call it showcase. That's why we're showcasing it. We certainly use the we can certainly use them as like we can go do leather work there or I can write emails um, to my friends, um, all those sorts of things. But officially when you're not living there, it's a showcase. That's why we call it Boneyard Studios Tiny House Showcase. Um, hopefully that will change someday, although it's probably not likely under the current zoning rewrite. Anyway, about all that research I did that I just told you, I thought I kinda had it down, right? So then I go with, you know, the property deed and hand down to DCRA, which is the zoning authority. And I say, well, I'd like to get a building permit to not build a tiny house because technically, as we, a lot of us know, right, we don't need a building permit to build a tiny house on wheels. Great, you know, that's a great selling point. Uh, but you do need a permit to put up a fence or to build, bring electricity in, or actually to excavate more than 50 square feet of topsoil and move it. <laughs> um, so I went down there and handed them, and, and the secretary there just laughed at me. She's like, there's no address. It's an alley lot. <laughs> you have a, a suffix and a, zone and all that stuff, but there's no alley address. And so we can't issue you a building permit because of the stupid system they have. They basically said no address, no address, no building permit. So that was kind of a problem. That was a, kind of a dark day. Um, you go out for another drink? Another drink, another drink, yeah. I had a good, good companion. Keeping some bars in business with this project, I know. Um, so we um, kind of went back to the codes and to try to figure out we do with our dead in the water. We can't even build a fence around this property, let alone like put up a tiny house, bring in any electricity, etc. So fortunately there was a little tweak in the code that you could nobody there at the office knew about, um, but I read about it and I was like, oh we can probably get around it by claiming like a health and safety public interest um, clause essentially to allow an address to be assigned to an alley lot if it's in the public interest. So I quickly made a case, well there's a abandoned stone vehicle Lights aren't very good out on the lot, and there's, you know, crime has happened out there. And the building code inspector, head, head of building code, who I'm now on a first name basis with, agreed. Um, and basically was able to issue an address um, on the lot so we can kind of proceed with our, with our plans. Um, so anyway, all that is to say, do your homework on your lot. <laughs> Extensively, even beyond what you think might be normal. Um, another issue we had uh, is one fine July morning came out, there's a big stop work order on, on the shipping container, which basically means you can't step foot on your property until it gets resolved. And why was a stop order, stop work order issued to us? Well, because a neighbor who we'd already fired and spoken to um, claimed that we were doing conducting commercial activity. So I can see, you know, how you might see like three trailers lined up and say, oh, they're manufacturing and housing, uh, doing commercial activity on what is a R3 residential residentially zoned piece of property. So um, 
Anyway, it basically created a big headache um, for about a month while we patiently explained to officials of DCRA, um, <laughs> I've been down there nine times in person and counting, uh, what we were doing out there. Got it resolved, we were completely you know, correct in terms of all our activities and permits and stuff. And we decided to clear it up and explain um, several times to the head of zoning and the head of building codes, what are we doing on that lot? Um, but unfortunately, you know, Tony had flown out from LA to help build and we were delayed a month, a little frustrating. Um, but that all goes back to another point we already made, which is outreach, 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 in terms of doing this on a larger scale. People have got to understand what's going on. And even if there's one squeaky wheel, man, that'll derail, for, that can derail you quickly. But we've also had a ton of city officials then come out out of interest, too. Yeah, oh, we absolutely. heard about you in a meeting, and then they just want to come up and take a look, and cops and firefighters. Yeah, that, it's a little unnerving, but it's actually great. I, I welcome with the head of the building code in D.C., like, very randomly showed up one day, and I was sitting there, you know, doing work at the drill out, <laughs> and he brought, like, three of his, you know, co-workers, and wanted to give him a little tour, and, you know, everyone seemed quite excited to be out there and be explaining what we're doing, and, you know, it's, it's a little novel, it's, but it's very interesting to folks who typically do perhaps drier type duties every day, so. Um, that's all I'm going to yak on about zoning and code, um, other than to also make sure, I think we really just to kind of underline the point, we need to really, as a movement, think about how do we change the zoning um, so we can allow this kind of, these timing rules to, to work. Yeah, and we haven't gotten at all into any of the zoning and code rewrite that's happening in DC currently that's touching on a lot of like accessory dwelling units and backyards and it's creating a huge sort of polarization between different wards and, and different folks in the city. Of course, we're a proponent for allowing ADUs, um, but we've been involved in some of, in some of those talks and efforts. Um, and like most cities, tiny homes on wheels are not considered a house, it's a travel trailer. So it's legal to park them on your land in most cities, but you can't use it as a residential um, enterprise. So we want to just give you like a little bit of some pictures and photos and kind of take you through sort of the arrival of the houses on the lot and choose where and who's who. Sorry. Can you hear okay? Yeah. Do you think it might have been the noise of your construction or just the fact that he can see it from his window? It was, this is a, it's a, a neighbor who consistently has, right, okay. so it's, it's anything and everything. We've had many cases since then, but yeah. The short answer is there, there are a few disgruntled neighbors who were upset they couldn't park, granted illegally, couldn't park, continue parking on the spot because it was being used. So we tried to explain it and we gave, you know, parking permits for months to the folks who wanted to keep parking there until we actually started, but it was a, um, and we do, we do follow like all the construction hours and everything, um, you know, never before 7 a.m., not past 7 p.m. We're kind of like, none of us really get started before 9 anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, uh, we had a tumbleweed model, which was very helpful actually to have on the lot um, last summer. Well, actually since the spring, probably since April. And so that was one of the first houses that arrived on the lot. So it's kind of nice because people were able to actually see what we were going to be building. Um, and we had it there until the fall, I think, right? Yeah, late fall. So we had it there for over six months. Uh, so this is Brian moving the tiny house with this contraption we bought, which we do not recommend buying. Um, uh, it didn't work as it did on the video. But. And then, as you saw before, so Brian and Jay both got trailers. Um, I was also looking for a trailer, and as I will talk about in my little design chat tomorrow night, I ended up uh, buying a tiny house on wheels that had already been started in South Carolina because it was like half the price of the trailer and it was already started, but uh, yeah, I pretty much rebuilt it. <laughs> so that's mine that came up from South Carolina before it got torn apart and reconstructed. And this is during one of our many happy hours on the lot that we like to have. So that's mine, the pair of house. Brian's trailer is in between, filled with stuff from my house that we took off, uh, and drinks. <laughs> Jay's house, who Jay is our other uh, Boneyard Studios member who is currently on a road trip across the country, but he, we met him at that Wangari Gardens event that we told you about, the big outreach event, and, and we said, we asked if we had extra space on the lot for someone else to build, we said yes. So he joined us, and <coughs> as you'll learn later, Elaine has also joined us. Um, so there's Brian's house under construction in the middle when it was still in the middle of the lot. 
and here's Elaine's house. So Elaine had contacted Brian, uh, when was that, Elaine, back in the fall maybe, or summer? Yeah, last summer. Last summer, about, you know, if we had space for another house on the lot, because she wanted to park her house there. Um, so we moved Elaine's house onto the Boneyard Studios lot. So we had this whole day, we have a video on our website called like the Tiny House Shuffle. We had to move every single house except mine. And it was an all day affair. It was horrible. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a tight alley. It is not easy to. Um, yeah, we remove the fence. We have to go up and down the alley with the different houses. Um, there's Brian's house. His is 11 feet wide, so it's even wider. I mean, you can see it barely is clearing like the electrical wires and um, oh, you want to 11 feet. Oh. Yeah, and there's my house all by itself with all the other houses gone, looking very lonely. But and so now we're repositioning them. Brian's house gets pushed up, as you'll see in a later picture, and then Elaine's house didn't stay there because Jay's came in. Right. Yeah. So, it was like tiny house musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> they were like 12 different synchronized. We had like chart outs, thin alley lots, and four houses. Yeah, we had like a whole yes. diagram for how we were going to move these and where we were going to back them and get a couple trucks. And, but it all worked out. I was, you know, pleasantly surprised. So, yeah, so let's, we'll just give you like a brief overview of each of the houses um, before we talk about some of the community issues. and. Yeah. Start I'll, go through, start yeah, I'll, I'll go through Jay's. Okay. Yeah. So we've got, as I said, we've got Jay Austin. Uh, he has a house called the Matchbox. We've got Elaine Walker for indulgent restraint. We've got my house called the Para House. It's just my last name. It's what an architect who's helping me named it. So <laughs> mine's very creative. And Ryan's house, the Minimum House. So Jay, um, oh, that doesn't turn out. The Matchbox. Um, Jay designed, uh, he designed his own house. It's pretty much a flat roof. I mean, there's like a two degree slope to it or something, but it's a flat roof. Um, he did a type of siding where you uh, char cedar. It's a Japanese style of siding, and it turned out really nice. I don't know how to pronounce it. Sujiban. Um, built a deck. You'll see some interior photos in a minute. He's doing rainwater collection, so he's got those rain chains. Uh, he used open cell foam insulation in his and drywall for the interior. Um, he's got a small loft, as you'll see up there. One side kitchen, he's going to have like seating on the other side. He's got just a very small sort of bathroom area to the left in the back and then a little desk on the right. Jay is uh, very minimal. He doesn't have a refrigerator. He's like D. Um, it <laughs> doesn't need a refrigerator. He has, what else? He has a little burn, um, convection burn top. Um, he, did about it. he did everything electric. He did everything electric, yeah. Kept it simple. Um. Elaine, I don't know if I can properly summarize your house, but it's a really welcome addition. It's, it's such a treat to have it out there. Um, it also like, legitimized us even more because we had like, an actual tumbleweed house on the lot mm -hmm. after the other one left. Um, so it's a beautiful little structure, um, which is based on the tumbleweed. Lesbian. Lesbian, yep. Um, and so right now it's, you know, like the other ones, it's, 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 it's empty, but we use it you know, occasionally for uh, events and it's always open to the public. So uh, that's the, that's Elaine's house. And then, oh yeah, you're going to yeah. talk about yours. Good. Yeah. So this is my house um, called the Para House. As I said, it went from this house here to that. Basically the reason why we had to redo it is because A, I hated the pitch of the roof. that kind of looked weird. Um, and the guy who built it left a foot on either end of the trailer's unused space, so not like two feet in the front or two feet in the back to do like a porch, just a foot on either. It didn't make any sense. So I had a friend in South Carolina who told me like, there's a super cheap thing that's already been started. You know, you could start from that. So Tony went down and picked it up, and then we realized that, eh, it's better just to start a new. So pretty much everything is new except the two sidewalls, and did a whole new roof and dormers, and. Um, that's I love my loft, skylight, and dorms, and um, an open floor plan. And this is just some renderings from an architect who's been helping me about you know what the interior might look like eventually. So uh, this is Minimum House, uh, which I've been building with uh, my builder David Manford from Element Design and Build, and with the help of uh, architects. Uh, 
Michael Couch of Foundry Architects in DC. Um, I will say a lot more about this during the I can't say that word. <laughs> Tomorrow um, I'll do a little more in depth. But basically, it's, it's kind of the McMansion on the tiny house lot. It's a wide load, um, like 11 feet by 21. Um, and I was trying to kind of re envision a little bit what the tiny house could be. Could it be a little bit more livable, a little bit more light, no loft? Um, could the construction be a little bit easier than this traditional stick built? So it's built out of SIPS panels. Um, which I'll talk more about that later, but um, they're basically just pre surprise you know, but there's like a sandwich of OSB plywood with foam in the middle, and they come already pre-cut, and they kind of just go together. It sounded like they were put together like Lego blocks, but I realized it's not that easy. <laughs> but it's also not that hard. Um, so... Is it solid foam? Solid foam, okay. yeah. How thick are the blocks? Uh, they're, uh, well, once the siding's on and everything, you've got about six inches. Okay. Um, and so we're about... 80% done. And you um, have to have a permit to get on any kind of road, I assume. For wide load, or yeah. Okay. For wide load, you need every jurisdiction is a little different, but you need like an escort and flag and stuff. Yeah. Um, but not that much wider. And so this is the inside. A few pictures. I'll have more pictures tomorrow. We can talk about um, talk about all the design details. But it's on a trailer, though. It is. Yeah, standard trailer. trailer. Standard. Actually, Jay and I bought identical matching trailers. Um, Kaufman, down in North Carolina. What size? They're 14,000 um, gross, gross weight uh, trailers. 20, 20, 20. Oh, sorry, 20, uh, 20, 22 feet. Yeah, 22 feet. Uh, standard, standard with, you know, like 100 switches. Um, so, yeah, I can talk more about that. That's, I guess, the design details. Yeah. Um, so, so we're, we're just teasing you to come to the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Use the mic. Yeah. Can I talk to you about the kitchen? <laughs> Brian, uh, use the uh, use the mic just so that we can oh, hear sorry. the sorry, sorry, sorry. recording. Sorry. Thanks. Um, yep. I'll stand up here. Yep. Good. Better. Is that better? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, press. I was going to say a few words about press, and he's going to help me because I'm going to miss some things. Um, so. This project, even before we started, we had people calling us this because DC is, is kind of a small town and word got around. And we decided, you know, we're going to just hold off on press because we don't even know, like, we didn't have anything set up with DCRA, zoning, codes. We didn't have a fence around it. We had really nothing to show people. So we kind of made this informal decision, you know, no press for a while. Um, but it turns out that it's a pretty good story, right? Tiny houses in the city. Um, and so we decided, kind of very deliberately in the fall, um, last fall, to have a Washington Post reporter come out. Um, you know, everyone's read so many stories, right, about tiny houses. And I guess one personal issue I have is, I think everyone in this room can kind of tell you, tell me, tell each other what the typical tiny house story is, right? Like, oh, there's these kind of funny people who live in small structures. <laughs> Why? How do they do it? Um, and it's, okay, that's cool. Um, that's a great story. It's a sexy story. It's a story that's, uh, that sells um, to readership. And undoubtedly, we were going to have stories written like that in some way. But we also decided back to like our bigger mission that actually this is an opportunity to talk about bigger picture issues. I mean, it's a fact that we've lost like half our affordable housing in DC in like the last 10 years. So what are we doing about it? Um, tiny houses may not be you know, the solution, but it might be one tool, maybe. Um, and what about all the zoning? Uh, rewrite. Like, are there ways that we can rewrite the zoning codes? Maybe not to allow tiny houses and wheels to be habited on the alley lots, but maybe if we can allow more accessory dwelling units um, to be constructed behind homes, like the carriage houses, the granny pads, to allow more affordable housing in, in the district. So we kind of developed a list of talking points, and really trying to push the story a little bit, it's a bigger picture, and we tried screening some of the journalists. Like, you just tell some of the journalists wanted to talk about the crazy tiny house people. Uh, and that's fine, but actually it turns some people off uh, as much as it turns other people on. And it also kind of misses the big picture, some of the big picture issues, which we really want to highlight. Um, so we developed talking points and we tried screening some journalists. And of course, as we all learn, as we all know, journalists are going to write the story they want to write, but you can at least try to guide the story a little bit, which we've tried to do with some success and some failure. So as you can see from our website, uh, we've got a, little, a few stories that are not... Well done, fairly well done. Um, others that are okay. Um, and we try and 
like with yeah. this story even. So there's a the neighborhood we're in, DC, Washington DC is rapidly, rapidly gentrifying. There are a lot of very tense issues uh, happening and have been for a long time. But um, you know, the neighborhood we're in is pretty middle professional class. A lot of new time home buyers though too, coming from different neighborhoods. Uh, but there's also a big public housing project up the street, and the, the two organizers there really like what we're doing. Uh, during the Rachel storm last summer, invited us over. They thought we were living there, didn't have electricity, and um, they wrote some nice letters of support. And so we've always, you know, when we do press, we try to let people know, like, go talk to the city about the zoning rewrite. Go, please, you know, here are the names and contact information for the neighborhood organizers um, on public housing. And, and try and kind of push them to take a little bit broader view, but they don't necessarily do that. <laughs> I do able to talk to people they wouldn't normally talk to, yes. hopefully through our efforts, that's the goal. Um, what's really fun and interesting, and maybe frustrating too, is once that story comes out, right, then there's like the spin game, right, and the comments and everything else, which, you know, I knew nothing about, kind of, you know, had some sense of how the story might play, but you never really know until it hits. Um, so, well, the first thing I'll talk about is the conservative view of these stories. So we had some really nice quotes on this one. Um, there are all these conservative bloggers out there. And we are, you know, tiny house, eco nuts. Um, and this is my favorite one in the middle um, by the atheist conservative. Um, no dystopia yet conceived by any fiction writer. No actual communist society in all history matches up to this nightmare. <laughs> You're in dangerous company. You should probably go home now. <laughs> so that's fun. I mean, it's crazy, but it's fun. Um, and but then there's some other ones that are maybe a little more. Well, this is the third one too. Um, we, we recall the uh, community of Obama houses, right? Because like, <laughs> everything is political in DC, right? And this is a ripe opportunity for bloggers to say, oh, these these tiny house people, they're in DC, and so they must be political. And, all these little houses, you know, show that the economy is not working for Americans. They have to live. They're being forced into these small houses. Well, that was the big thing about being forced to live this way. I'm sure you all have seen this, but with your own individual efforts, rather than having it be a choice. And that we're not saying everyone has to live this way. This is like very one small little piece of the puzzle, right? And it's just something we're personally choosing to do. Um, but that's a kind of a hard message to get a point apart. So I guess one message here, takeaway is like, of course, whatever you do, right, people are going to interpret it the way they're going to interpret it. You can't lose any sleep over it, even though we did. Um, <laughs> then there's some other kind of more legitimate, you know, misunderstandings, and it, it speaks to kind of when do you go public. But we had, you know, pictures of these houses uh, kind of half built, and so people looked at them and they're like, oh, that's a Home Depot shed. Why are they spending thirty thousand dollars on that? Um, and so that's just, you know, kind of speaks to when you time the release and do you go radio first, which might be a better way, then start doing like the image based media, the video and the, and the like newspapers. Uh, so anyway, that's that's the press. And that kind of leads us into, so we did this press piece. We didn't think it was gonna be that big of a deal as the Washington Post and it totally kind of spiraled out and other people started posting it and we had all these visitors come by the lot unannounced bringing us please just let me in, I bought you cookies, come on, you have to let me in. Yeah. And we were letting people come, but we thought, okay, we, we, we really can't get any work done, because every weekend, just people were driving by and wanting to stop and chat and learn about it. And that's what our mission is, we want to provide that opportunity, so that's when we implemented our open houses. So we will go on to the events page, which this is sort of my passion, where I spend the majority of my time, which is probably why my house isn't done yet. <laughs> so, we host open houses on a monthly basis, usually the last Sunday of the month, um, and people sign up, and we have anywhere from like 20 to 80 people. We've also done a couple uh, open houses that are specific, so we worked with the American Institute of Architects to do a, an open house for architects and builders in the area uh, that they could get continuing education credit for. Uh, I think we've had a school group out before, and so we like to have people out, and it's just an opportunity for them to learn about what we're doing, tour the houses, we had a couple fly from Minnesota. Um, I mean, if you really think about it, one of my main motivations was I wanted to give people the opportunity. I, I had taken a tiny house workshop, but it really didn't prepare me for building a tiny house, and I didn't get to see a tiny house. And so I wanted to give people the opportunity to A, come and see a tiny house, and B, the opportunity to 
even come out and work. I hold volunteer work days. So, you know, just kind of get their hands in there without having to sign up for a full workshop before committing because it's a big commitment to do this. It takes over your life and it's a financial commitment and um, I think it's important that people, if they want the opportunity, and it's great on the lot, you can see, you know, a tumbleweed design, you can see two designs that we've kind of made up as we've gone along, mine and Jay's, and you can see Brian's that was designed by um, architect, it's a wider model, so we've got a model without a loft, we've got models with lofts, we've got models without decks, with decks, different types of insulation, um, all sorts of different types of siding. Um, so community workshops, we've also done a few community workshops, there's a great organization in DC uh, where you can host workshops, and so this was one last summer, this was the day after our big derecho storm, so half the people didn't show up. But everything on the lot had will survive, except I think we had some fences blow away. <laughs> um, I also run a meetup group that I started, as I mentioned, a couple of years ago after taking the tumbleweed workshop. I only do them like three or four times a year now because it's kind of a lot to organize. But uh, this was the first meetup group we did actually on the Boneyard Studios lot. But it's a way it would, we've definitely I've met several people through that who've already started their own projects in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, there's two guys who both have land outside of DC. College Park and Silver Spring, who are open to having people build and live on their land. So it's just a really great resource for people to kind of start meeting each other um, and chatting about their interests. <coughs> Nighttime on the lot, we have parties and fires, and it's fun. What was time? Social aspect. <laughs> uh, pretty much any Friday, you know, <laughs> the work. We have a lot of construction debris that we burn. Lots of fireworks. Uh, these are the volunteer work days, so especially uh, you'll see tomorrow during my presentation I had a lot of work to do with my siding, so I had a lot of people come out and help me over the course of a couple months and just help me with various things, which is a good thing, but it also kind of sets you back. Um, it's a lot to sort of organize a group of volunteers, and I've never been a project manager or done construction, but it's, it's fun to be able to have a bunch of people out on the lot. These are just some more pictures of treating my siding and putting it up. And the Tiny House Concerts! I'm a huge music fan and I love the Tiny Desk Concert Series that NPR produces. So we just started a summer concert series at Boneyard. And this is the first group called Crooks and Crows who played and they actually made a video in the style of the Tiny Desk Concert Series. And it's on YouTube now. Uh, we have another one coming up in t next weekend actually with the local band The Sweater Set. They've won a lot of folk awards. And we've got a couple more coming in the fall, so that's, that's another little thing that we do. Um, I to say, before we go back to the app, I said, look, I just wanted to, like, kind of a few sort of lessons learned about, like, community and creating community. Um, as I said, like, I, I think we both, like, wanted this to be a space for people to come together. And... There's a lot of various ways that people can be involved, like at New York Studios, whether it be through like signing up for a community work day or just coming to an open house. Uh, but we've also met like a lot of really great technical people in the community, and we've really kind of tried to, I think, spread the the wealth or something. Like I've, you know, trying to find various people to build the interior components for my tiny house, like a couch, a custom couch bench design. Uh, so we brought in a lot of people who have technical knowledge who might want to help out and it's been, I think, probably one of the most rewarding things about this is just the great people that we've met in DC that tends to be a very buttoned up, 9 to 5, gray, black, suit type city and for me that's really hard. So this project has just been a really great opportunity to make, make some really good friends. And so we'll just Can I ask about the bed. There are all these all this weight on the bed. Yeah. And yet it seems very um, not very just, what is it, two by four? It's an inch and a half uh, two steel. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was they, a test though. We I did I did text Jay and Matt, an architect. <laughs> How much weight can that <laughs> <laughs> take take a look at the mushroom the mushroom okay. house and the and the loft supports for that if you get a chance to go through that. It's, okay. I think it's the same cool. system. Or and he's presenting on Sunday, right? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, the tiny technical team. <laughs> so as Brian mentioned, um, neither of us are builders. I have never really even operated a drill or driver set. And now I have a chop saw and a planer and all this stuff that I really... I have a limited like, kind of male 
kind of misguided confidence that I can do things, but it's actually not true, so I hired a builder as well. So this is our technical team. Uh, we've got Tony Goldfest, who's a, a good friend of mine from the West Coast, who is looking to leave LA, and he has since moved out to DC and has been helping on all of our projects. He's the primary builder on mine. Uh, Matt Batten, who's an architect in, of Urban Density Lab in DC, who's put in countless hours on the lot and actually lent us the majority of his shop, which was really great for us to use in the construction of our houses, and he's designed a lot of my house. Um, and then your technical team. Oh yes, David Bamford, as I mentioned, home and design builder. Again, local DC um, builder and also architect, and then uh, Will Couch, who actually I hired first before finding David. So as many of you know, there's like a whole bunch of different approaches to, if you're not going to build, design, build something yourself, you can hire an architect and then hire a builder or design, build, team, etc. So I, I kind of did the, the former um, inadvertently, but it's worked out great. So why are there bathrooms, I wonder, instead of just nailing into the plywood? I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. It's a rain screen siding <coughs> approach. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can talk about that during the Q&A as well, but we just kind of wanted to get through this. Yeah. Damn, it's getting warm here. Um, here we all are in our standard issue gray attire. You must wear gray. Everyone, you're, if you did not realize this during open house, someone took a picture. We're like, wow, we all have gray on. <laughs> so yeah, with that, Yep, no, we clocked in right at one hour and one minute, so that leaves lots of time for Q&A for you guys. Um. <laughs> Question. So, I know it depends on what you put in here and what the walls are made of, and you can use metal wood, but what is the pull weight on this baby? <laughs> Sorry, like, what's the... The pull weight. I mean, how much are you pulling on this? How much do these babies weigh when they're done? I will vary by structure. Right, um, but what's the heaviest to move it The The minimum house is the wide load house, um, yeah. which is right to the far Yours, right yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, that'll probably clock in around 12,500, 13,000, but it's built on 14,000. So. You need kick-ass V8 pull-ass Yeah, we, I mean, for, for most of these, for moving them around, it was a good test, right, to see. And basically, a Ford 50 year or greater is what you need. Do you have plans for any future sites? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You guys have to get back. Do you have any plans for uh, other sites? We don't. Um, we, yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, you know, we this is enough to keep us busy, but we really want people to, like, take this as inspiration to go and do this. And so the meetup group in DC, I actively know a few people who are looking for land or want to do this. Um, the hard thing is, is people will often come and say, I want to do this. And where can I do this that's secure, that I know it's legal? I mean, it's legal to do what we're doing, but it's a gray area of the zone. There's no city that really defines having a travel trailer on your property and what you can and cannot do there is pretty great. So you have to be willing to take some risks. I mean, that's just the way it goes right now. So, but we definitely know of other people who are looking to do similar things. Of course, J.J. Schaefer out in California is already in the works for, you know, that's one model, buying property and getting it zoned as an RV park. Um, and that's probably the most promising um, yeah. approach is you already have something in the code, right? Of course, DC doesn't really have that in their code, but other more suburban areas do. Um, and the whole idea of the project, in large part, or the mission, right, is to catalyze you know, interest and inspire folks to go out and keep pushing, right? Not in DC, but wherever you, know, you live. Um, and happily, I think we're going to start making some maybe small changes in public perception in DC. Like just next week, um, we some uh, officials from Montgomery County, which is adjacent to DC, are coming in to get a kind of a private tour to talk zoning. And, and tiny houses. So we have a lot of events and sort of quiet tours there with planning folks and hopefully planting some seeds. Yeah, that's true. I and mean, we also do talks like we've been, re you know, Urban Urban Land Institute had us, mm -hmm. different policy related discussions. So thank you. And you, you know, it may make sense. Sorry, right, sorry, I just uh, right behind you and then you're up. Yeah. Um, did I, did I understand you correctly when you guys were speaking? You did not go through the normal zoning change procedure in order to be able to put these out. Right, exactly. So, so it's still R3. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Yep. When you went through closing, did you close as a residential property? Did you close as a commercial property? No, it's zoned R3, and so it closes R3. Okay. 
um, did you guys do any kind of a phase one EPA test before you closed on it? No, thought about soil tests. Um, they're expensive. She probably should have been no EPA phase one, et cetera, test, no. Okay, and then as far as the ownership piece of it, in the deed record book, you're listed as the owner, right? Correct, yep. Anybody else, you didn't flag out the common space, you didn't do any of that kind of work on it, so that it's strictly you, everybody else is a guest of yours. Correct, so there's a lot of different cooperative models out there. Um, we sort of moved quickly just to be able to get the land and start building. Um, we're all in somewhat tight timelines. Uh, it's something that should be explored more, perhaps even we should explore more. Um, but right now, yeah, I just want to have bought the land. Um, and then people contribute, everyone contributes for like the common utilities, uh, for the shipping container, and that kind of stuff. So that in terms of expenses out there, the things that we all use together, it's shared. Okay, did they finally issue an address? They did. They did. So we had to get the address in order to get the permit, so finally we did end up getting that address assigned. Okay, which means now they could technically come drop a water meter if you wanted it. And we wanted to pay for it, yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As well as electric service, yes? We have electric out there, yeah. That was relatively painless okay. process. And then did they do a reassessment for tax purposes? No reassessment so far, no. Okay. I think that, you know, there's been nominal improvements to the actual property, right? The fence and maybe the electric hookup. But otherwise, there's been no real improvements. To the yeah, still they should technically not attach. Right? Correct, yeah, because they're all trailers. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. And there's a question right in front of you. Yeah, it just seemed to me that, that there's so much uh, information in the room and expert, you know, beginning to be expertise that you're eventually going to need kind of model zoning regulations that people could share across the country or, you know, it might be proposed that you could advocate for in the, in the political process. Absolutely, and I believe there's an upcoming session dedicated just to that subject. So I'm going to plug that, although I'm not sure who's leading it. Do you know? Who's doing the zoning code? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Who's doing that? I think between D and I will address that a bit, but okay. uh, it's not, neither of us addressing that as a full topic. Okay. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, to see the kind of the bigger picture, you know, questions we need to. I think, I think the panel discussion, when is the, when is the case? Sunday. So the so panel discussion is going to talk about the difference between, a, uh, I'm maybe I'm paraphrasing, but like a moral application of rules and, and that sort of thing versus illegal. And you know our our existing code system is is a funny thing because we've got one way of looking at the code, which is essentially uh, you know what's written in in, in the law. And, and then an abstraction of that is the interpretation of that, which <laughs> takes individuals. And then underlying all of that is the application. You know, so so there there are three components of the written law, application, and interpretation. So it gets complex, and I think I think we will have a chance to talk about that. And you guys are totally my heroes for taking that very complex process on in the way you have. Well, and we found you get a different question answer than yes. yes. you <laughs> ask, too, so it is. And occasionally, I've learned from my government, not this project, it's sometimes better not to ask the questions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of questions up here I want to get yeah, to, yeah. yeah? Actually, I would really love to know more, more detail, maybe not right now, uh, but how you started and how you gathered people together. That, that would really got me interested in spreading it to a community. Yeah. I just love outreach and meeting people and <laughs> so I organizing. How, I, I yeah, went to a tumbleweed workshop and I collected everyone's emails at that workshop because the only reason I went to the tumbleweed workshop, I had already devoured all the blogs and tiny house books and everything. So I had friends who'd gone and said, eh, you know, go get the basics, but it's, you're not going to like, learn how to build your whole house, but it's great to go and meet people in the area. And then I organized meetups, so I emailed everyone and I started hosting them at my house because I actually live in a very big apartment. Um, the meetups are online, right? Meetup done. Yeah, yeah, we've got like 200 members now. So. Organizing tool online. And they came to your house from afar? Yeah, from, you know, some of them came from Baltimore. Or, yeah, I really want to know, then, then, then what? what did you, then, what was like, your goal? What was, 
And the goal was to provide a space for people to meet and chat, and there were several people who kind of broke off. There were three women, actually, that we knew, Lovelet and her friends, who kind of broke, like, they were all interested in building a tiny houses together in West Virginia, and so, you know, people kind of form their little groups and meet people who might be interested in doing something similar to, you know, maybe someone has land and someone else is looking to build, or, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, maybe this is not kind of for it, but you said that you can just get your property really zoned or designated as a trailer park. Now, that must be very difficult to achieve, I would say. In D.C., yeah. absolutely, but there are other jurisdictions where that is already set up within the zoning. Uh -huh. uh, and so, you know, like what Jay is doing, I think he's already, he hopefully will be here Sunday, right, to talk I more about this. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, as I understand, maybe someone knows more, but it's basically taking an existing plot of land that is zoned for what we call like recreational or uh, manufactured housing park is the correct term. Uh, and so basically taking that, but instead of putting some kind of aesthetically questionable traditional structures there, just doing all tiny houses. So. And where is that? Yeah, let's, let's not give up. Yeah, I don't want to give up that wrong information, but more like tiny houses is Jay's and I think he's probably logged about it by now. Okay. <laughs> I've got to go back to the potty thing. So no water in, no water out, but what do you do with the contents of your incinerating toilet? I mean, I assume they don't evaporate entirely, but there's something left. It's so ash. Yeah. 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 Totally sterile. It's like a just a layer. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know who had their hands up first. He did. He did. No, oh, oh, you. <laughs> All right, sorry. We're here. Financing at like initially off the, off of that, did you guys get some type of uh, loan? Was it like money pulled together from the members? Kind of mixed. So we, like Brian so, said, it just yeah, he had the resources to. It's also to finance, us. you know, yeah. for better or for worse. I'm really curious though to talk to folks over the course of the weekend about how if anyone's like approached banks, everyone asks yeah. this question: Well, can you get money? And then of course that's also tied to insurance because banks tend to not loan against. Something that's not insured, so it's that's a everyone right who studied this knows it's a kind of a difficult question. So we did what most people are doing right now, which is basically self-financing. Um, hold on. The orange shirt, maybe the whoever this guy. Well, on the way back there, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, you guys have any thought about what kind of density is possible in an urban setting with tiny houses like this. That's a good question. Yeah. We, I mean, originally I thought we. Thought maybe five, and that feels like it would be a bit crunched. Um, I think like a structure in someone's backyard, but honestly, I don't see this as a solution to to housing or affordable housing in an urban environment because you can get a lot den more dense um, structures up. But it is a solution in the case of a lot of cities where you have huge backyards, and there's areas in D.C. where there are huge backyards or blocks that can't be built on. Um, so that's kind of where we see this small little niche going. Uh, the other thing is, it's, what's been interesting is we're often, we've sat on a couple panels and done some media where they group us together with all the folks doing the micro units in New York City, San Francisco, DC, which is interesting because it's a very, very different, I mean, we're all a proponent of all sorts of different types of housing, right? But it's a very different demographic, uh, it tends to be, and a lot of those units have been actively opposed by affordable housing advocates. So it's just kind of interesting to see, like people just see small spaces and think, oh, you're all the same. But <laughs> my is just to clarify, being right in a not a detached structure, right? Like basically multifamily housing, but very small units, like 300 square feet or 400 square feet, or even less. Um, so. uh, yeah, sorry, I'm bad at this. Oh, if you want to answer. over here, then. In the back and then the rest of it. Can you tell me again the site that you went to to find the lot? Oh, it's called Redfin. It's not in all cities or states, it's a sort of standard real estate website. Uh, a lot of it on the, on the market for over two years, so it's kind of sitting there partially because no one could do anything with it, right? You can't build a house there, you can't even rent it out to your neighbors for parking because that's commercial activity, right? So there's very little that could be done. Um, and most real estate websites have a, just like a, a vacant land or property search and through going on the various ones you'll see like some of them have more land than others and but can I offer a suggestion? Lots of cities have what, what are now called land banks mm -hmm. 
um, throwaway lots, a lot of them will be listed in the land bank. They're landlocked, they're too small, they, you can't really use them for anything else, and they'll sit out there for four or five years, and you can usually pick them up on the cheap. Okay, that's great to know about. And then we have one in the back here. How, how expensive are your taxes? The taxes are assessed against the actual property, which has no structures on it. Um, and I think it's assessed at like 20 grand or something. I think the taxes are $210 a year. So, appreciate you. Yeah, I just have you you any gauge on how you've impacted the, the area in your neighborhood? Has the general feeling of the neighbors is more up to you? Are they all more? What's that? Fairies, right? I mean, yeah. most of the neighbors are super positive. Uh, we have people who brought us wine as welcoming gifts, or stop by. Some of the neighbors came by for the Tiny House concert. Um, there's, a few there's a lot of neighbors we never see, don't lose their back. Yards or porches, their back areas very much that about that alley. So there's a lot of neighbors that we I mean, we're surprised we don't see like come in and out of their houses much. And there's other neighbors that we know quite well. And, so. I think it's safe to say you know everyone who's come by to talk or that we've kind of talked to directly have been quite positive. I mean the feeling out there on a daily basis is is really great. I mean Tony and I are out there usually almost all day every day. Working. There's, it's an alley lot, there's a little convenience store, also some alcohol, there's like just a lot of traffic. <laughs> but everyone's come by, and, and um, I think it's because they're happy to see us, maybe. Uh, but they're, they're very positive about the project. Yeah, we get lots of questions in the garden. Lots of just, curiosity. Just so you know, I mean, this is a very urban environment. We're right by North Capitol and another major street. It's like one of the busiest streets in D.C. that's on the other side it's of the row house. really hard to see from here, but it's very urban. We have a lot of foot traffic up and down the alley, and um, yeah. And so nobody guards it at night, or you're not worried about any... We have a security have camera, that. we've had a break-in, you know, all the normal urban stuff. Um, and for that neighborhood, unfortunately, um, we've had one or two incidents, but I think with the security camera and a few other things, um, it's improved. So. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, there's a few people who haven't asked questions. And I just want to make sure we get to those. Exactly. Let's and we're also around all weekend. And we're around all weekend, too. Yeah. <laughs> me? Have you asked a question, yet? me? Me? Yes. No, I've only heckled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, like, uh, out, of, out of the two of you and given your passion and, and kind of where your hearts are, what do you call home? I didn't mention. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, I've moved pretty much every two years of my life because my parents did international education. And I think I come in and I put on the blog or something like 35 different places and 36, so. <laughs> um, it's a lot. And I think that is a big reason why a tiny house on wheels attracted me. I call home, I guess, sort of wherever I am where I find community. I mean, I don't really have a definition, but I'm going to think on that. I would love to, uh, oh sorry, just to answer a question, I think for me, I would love to call the tiny house home. I would love that if you know, things are a little bit different, I could get up here and tell everyone that's home, that's where I live, unfortunately not, uh, but I feel most at home there, because it's a piece, it's a small little jewel, right, that every square foot, we spent literally a day for every square foot designing, you know, 210 square feet. It took a little longer than expected, but every single piece of that, of that little structure, I feel, part of. Um, so, and, and a lot has just been really just so, so pleasant. Um, I'm a big gardener and it's been my kind of dream come true to be able to plant the fruit trees and like there's like 30 herbs going and all these flowers and veggies and so uh, when I'm out there it's like, I'm, you know, it's, peace. it's very peaceful. Yeah, it's it's very magic. Peace. I mean it's really cool to see like people come by who swoop in their perceptions. And, yeah. what, what's the time frame for you to call it home? So. It, yeah, I'm just wondering, is, is there a point? I thought it was the law like, have to I change it or? months ago. Right. Well, <laughs> um, to me, like a structure is never a home, but I think this might be the first place that I will call home when I'm completed. It still feels very unfinished to me. So, hopefully in a couple months. Officially, we, as we said, we can't live there, but in terms of like, spending time there and doing art and you know, work, whatever it is, um, that's. That's something I'm doing there. Jay's been doing that. Tony's out there working a lot. So it all sort of feels like a community of you know, yeah. friends out there. So 
you, 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 can't, you can't sleep there and you can't do any commercial stuff. So your art, you can't sell it. Right, I mean, you know, you, yeah. yeah, basically you can't conduct commercial activity on the lot. There's That's a lot, the we, we're line. happy to talk more about like, there's some specific zoning things related to art studios, there's some stuff about like sleeping and, and you know, the amount of time you spend someplace, but there's never, there's not a definite answer, so. It's all very gray and open to interpretation. Anyone who has another question yet, and then we'll come back around. Sure. Far left here. Vinnies are close to the Potomac River. Has anybody come to you with canal, boat, barge people saying, hey, this looks kind of nautical, but not. How about slapping that on a pole? I, would, I thought about that. I would love it to be able to have like this kind of land, sea, tiny house. Um, but so far, that's another project. That's, don't have the bandwidth for it. We have a very strong houseboat community down at the Eight Point Marina in, in D.C., and we know some of that. And, um, it's been some of the zoning and what constitutes a lot of spending a lot of time someplace, and uh, we've talked with them about that and borrowed from RV, I mean RV, uh, boat, marine, marine systems. And, yeah. The marine catalogs, as probably many of you discovered, are just it's like found the possibility, right? In terms of, everyone knows about the little Dickinson stoves, right? You can put it in, Jay's been putting it in, it's great to move homes. But there's all those other, other cool technologies you can use, like pedestal systems, you have movable tables, and all kinds of cool stuff. But yeah, one day that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who doesn't ask a question back here? Yeah, gray water? Uh, you, you talked about the incinolet, but what about sink water, showers? Do you have showers in there? Well, no showers. I don't take a shower up there. Um, but in terms of like water, we're doing rainwater collection, like in my house, for example. Rainwater. So, right, yeah. right. But so when the rainwater is collected, it's stored in a tank, and then it gets pumped through stage filter and then it's being potable and then when that water goes through the drain I basically collect it and use it in the garden. So. I'm going to be doing some sort of very rudimentary gray water system with the help of a landscape architect or something. Uh, in the far back. Sorry if you've uh, explained this already. Um, do you get paid for anything that you do in the studio? No, no, not or? here. Uh -uh. No, we both have like, well, I have a full-time job, so I'm trying to make it half-time. <laughs> I have a part-time job, yeah. so I'm able to work out there um, and, and at home with that. So, but fortunately, I have some time to also build. Um, will you guys eventually like move your houses when you're itching to really live in them full-time, or do you see yourself like waiting it out until it's rebuilt and be like? That would, you know, hardcore. That was my question too. Yeah, like yeah, when will it be? When will it be like not enough to just? Are you going to like there? allow it move once you're, you're done with your houses, move into a, an actual living zone and allow people to come in and build their own structure and those? So you know, let's let's yeah. we can have some of these. Just, I would love to have these discussions okay. over the weekend. <laughs> um, it, a lot of people who are building tiny houses on wheels, none, a lot of them in backyards and stuff are not totally what's legal, what's not right. legal. And I'm happy to share more specific information um, throughout the weekend, I think. But yeah, I mean, ideally, I would like to try living in mine full time some time. And, um, but I've also thought of like, it might be out on some rural property at some point in time. I don't sleep here forever, but we definitely wanted a place to build and yep. you know learn about them. So. I mean, it's, it's probably obvious, but just like, we wouldn't be investing money in this if we couldn't live in them sometime, someday. Mm -hmm. um, down the road. Now we're being very public with the showcase because we have bigger mission, bigger goals. But the wheels are a risk mitigation strategy, right? It's, they go, they, there's a trail over they, they can go somewhere else. And why do we all have friends and backyards and a lot of folks who are living them right now, right? We, we could do something similar, um, but probably not on that lot. But it'd be hard. Have you hired counsel to help you with the zoning change in DC yet or not? Yeah, it's not, we're not going to on that right now, no. It's, there's, but yeah, there's the, a huge zoning rewrite going on right now, which has been like seven years in the making. Sure. We're trying to contribute productively to that. But this little project is like way outside the box. I mean, the fairly progressive changes that are being discussed and will be enacted. Are, are they putting back in, at least in D.C., the option for manufactured housing, new manufactured housing lots? I haven't seen that. The biggest, most positive sign I see is discussions of allowing <coughs> new accessory dwelling units. Accessory dwelling units, for those who right. don't know, are basically like the granny pads or the carriage houses. So right now there's some that exist in DC that were built back in the 50s that are 
inhabit it, but you can't build one behind your house. So what the new zoning code goes through as it's currently slated, that will allow you know, new small structures to be built as accessory, but detached dwellings behind the existing structures like a row house. Did they give a minimum square footage on that? There are, and I, you got me on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in the far, far back behind you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the zoning, I don't know much about it, but you know if the zoning rules have uh, changed during like northeast or southwest or like throughout the They do, but mm -hmm. slightly. So there's four classes of residential zoning. That's a really good question. So there's R1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and there's slight tweaks um, in each. So the, those zones simply correspond to denser or less dense areas of the city. So And the rules that pertain to each zone are slightly different. And it's very, I mean, this is, this is why it's so hard to talk about zoning, is it varies so much city by city. Um, I am not familiar, though, with any city that sort of, I think every city probably has very gray area when it comes to what's considered travel trailers and using that on your property as full-time living. It's pretty safe to say, and I don't see, like, D.C. taking that on, per se, at all. Um, but with the zoning code, like, for us, when we were researching, so each of those different, you know, uh, categories like R1, R2, you have to, for each little sub segment, you have to download a different Word document. There's no online HTML, there's no, like, every little, so you'd be like, oh, click here, and you'd have to download this Word document. So I have, like, hundreds of these Word documents with two, like, two sentences on them to explain some little subset of the zone. That so, was the research. Yeah. <laughs> so remember that, the first takeaway in this whole discussion is, you know, do your research, but the key step under that you know, action is to actually go in and talk to someone in your zoning and your building code agency. Because honestly, like DC, the last time we had a, a comprehensive rewrite was 1958. And so every every year there's there's amendments, right? And so it's a mess. I mean, you have to hire a lawyer, really. Or you can go down and talk to the good folks at DCRA who will very patiently explain to you what you can and can't do in the lot. Now, of course, when you go down there, you're going to be asking a lot of out-of-the-box questions, which will throw the whole bureaucratic system into some disarray. But the point is, engage. Try to engage. Um, ask questions and try to learn as much as you can. Um, and find someone who's, yeah, you know, a lot of people there might not like their jobs or whatever, but find someone who's, who's willing to chat with you. And yeah. No, I mean, for the record, I had very positive experiences, like, going down. You just have to face-to-face -face contact, describe what you're doing, you're well intentioned. You're not trying to break the law inadvertently. You're just trying to learn what the law is. So. Front here. Just a quick question: How hard is it to pull up house if you wanted? I mean, you've got some infrastructure there. If you were living there, say, how complicated is it to move the house if you wanted to go move somewhere else? Yeah. Um. So my, I have a removable porch that I would take off, um, unplug from my electrical box, empty my water tanks. Somewhere in our house, yeah. you know, yeah. we're a trailer. Okay. Yeah. Pretty easy. Do you have any idea what the penalties are if you did live there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. I mean, maybe some will test, but no, we're not going to test it. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's the, I mean, like anything, this is how does someone prove something and um, because I would love to keep on having these conversations over the weekend. I'm going to keep saying that. I'd yes, love to have, keep having these conversations <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> the far back. What are they considered living there? Like, I know in Vermont, considered if you stay here. I'm going to press rewind on the and then press play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Any other questions? Not related to zoning? Because I think we probably hashed that out as much as <laughs> um, you want a second question? <laughs> it's not a question, it's commentary. And, it, and it's more that, um, you know, uh, I just think you guys are really brave and really courageous for, for pushing the envelope a little bit and, and for being willing to go in and talk to building officials because it's intimidating. And um, I really honor, you know, what you guys have, have taken on and it's inspiring. I mean, I think that's something that all of us can learn from. So I really appreciate your bravery and all of that. Thank you.